So if I press this button, it should charge. It's actually charging. Eight volts, come on! Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Have you ever wondered if it's possible to build an electric bike without any electronics? Now, what I mean by no electronics is by following the definition according to Google, where electronics are the branch of physics and technology concerned with the design of circuits using transistors and microchips. We still need to use some wires and a battery, but I want everything else to be mechanical. Most modern electric bikes use a brushless DC motor, as they're incredibly powerful and efficient for their size. But they also require an electronic speed controller to power them, so you can't simply plug in a battery and go. But what if you could? <laughs> this video is sponsored by KiwiCo. More on them later. This is a reed switch motor, which gets its name from this tiny green capsule on the side, called a reed switch. And when a magnet is placed close to the switch, it closes and lets current flow. So these coils act as electromagnets, and as the permanent magnets pass the reed switch, power is applied to the coils, accelerating the magnets to the right and spinning the motor. Now I previously mounted a reed switch motor in a small toy car, and it ran really well as it consumed very little power and could even charge itself with a small push. So let's supersize this and stick it on a bike. This large version has a few slight differences, but it essentially works the same way. However, as an off the shelf reed switch can't handle more than about half an amp, I've had to make my own supersized reed switch. It's very simple with just two metal strips separated by a small gap just like the small reed switch. And when the magnet passes it, one of the strips is attracted towards the other and applies power to the coils. Now this motor has very little power, mostly because it only has six magnets per rotor, meaning the coils can only push the wheel six times per rotation. However, if we increase the number of magnets, we should be able to increase the output power. So I built this motor with 16 magnets and alternating magnetic pole directions, and it has far more torque. Though the reed switch had to be modified as the alternating magnets mess with the timing. So I positioned a small magnet on the flexible strip, so it's only attracted to the magnets with their opposite pole facing outwards. There also seem to be electrical connection issues with the nickel strips degrading over time due to the sparking. So I tried using a carbon contact that's usually found in brushed electric motors, but it ended up depositing carbon dust on the strip, which prevented a good connection and eventually found these small switches, which are apparently rated to 15 amps, and I stole the contacts out of them, which so far seems to be holding up far better. Let's start building the e-bike. The bike I'm going to use has a simple tubular frame, which makes it easy to design a 3D model in Onshape, which is a cloud-based CAD program that allows me to design a single piece motor mount for this e-bike. If you want to design your own projects like this, then I highly recommend checking out Onshape. I could then export the design and start 3D printing, which I decided to do on the Formlabs Form 4 and Form 4L, as the ability to make large strong parts whilst also being very precise is perfect for this project. That's a motor mount and motor core which will literally hold the whole system together, which is awesome being able to manufacture it as a single piece. I can then press fit the bearings into the part and check if my design fits the bike frame. And now we have a solid bracket to mount all the components to, the first of which being the coils, which I 3D printed using clear resin, so the coils should be visible from outside the motor. These coils are 300 turns each, and they're soldered 2 in series and will eventually be 8 in parallel, making a total of 16 coils and 4,800 turns of wire, which in my opinion looks awesome, and maybe a little ridiculous on a bike. The next step is to make the rotors, which will hold the magnets, and you may notice this rotor has far more magnet slots than the prototype motor. And that's because I recently came across something called a haulback array. If you take a look at the prototype motor from the side, there is a coil sandwich between two magnets, and we want the magnetic field between the two magnets to be as strong as possible. So when power is applied to the coils, we maximize the output torque. Therefore, if we take the alternating magnets of the rotor, and place smaller magnets between them in this perpendicular orientation, we can actually redirect some of the magnetic field to one side, creating a stronger and a weaker side. And this is known as a haulback array. So if we do this in a way that the stronger sides are both facing inwards towards the coils, we should be able to increase the torque. And I actually built another prototype motor to test this theory. 
and it's clear it has far more power. I even had to mount the reed switch closer to the rotor as the magnetic field outside of the motor is far weaker. So this final design has 20 main magnets and 20 smaller magnets that create the haulback array, making a total of 80 magnets with the two rotors. And these can be mounted to the shaft and drive pulley before being attached to the motor, which we can fit a rotor on both sides of the bike to sandwich the coils. Now we can mount the reed switch to the motor and it's ready for a test. So with everything wired up, I should be able to throttle the motor with this switch. Now even when things go wrong, I always learn something, which is why I'm excited to tell you about KiwiCo, because they're on a mission to inspire kids to innovate. I've been a fan of KiwiCo for a while and their crates are always fascinating to build. Like the quality of this crate and the thought that's gone into making it the perfect gift for any kid. I mean, it's literally a hovercraft that you can build at home without any tools. There are many other crates like this for kids of all ages with their KiwiCo clubs, which is a series of exciting hands-on learning adventures. With five clubs to choose from, you'll explore topics ranging from culture and geography to technology, art, and more. And if you're looking to put your science knowledge and engineering skills into a project, then there's also KiwiCo Labs, which include projects like this radio controlled delivery robot and many more. I really believe KiwiCo is an amazing gift for this holiday season, and it's a gift that keeps on giving month after month. So if you sign up using the code Tom Stanton, you can get 50% off your first club crate, or by going to kiwico.com forward slash Tom Stanton. So go check out the link in the video description. Despite running well below the 15 amps that these switch contacts are rated for, they burn up pretty quickly, or occasionally weld together, locking the motor. But I do have one last idea to get this working, and the potential solution is tungsten. Tungsten has the highest melting point of any metal at about 3400 C, which is about 1000 C higher than steel. So I ordered some tungsten welding rods to hopefully make some more durable reed switch contacts. But quickly ran into my first problem. It seems tungsten can't be soldered, at least with the solder I have and at the temperatures my soldering iron can go to. My solution to this is to use the solder as a mechanical connection to the tungsten, almost like crimping a wire. So I filed some notches into the tungsten rod to give the solder something to grab onto. Then I wrapped the nickel strip around the tungsten and filled it with solder. So when the tungsten is pushed into the molten solder tube and cooled down, it fixes the two together with hopefully a good electrical connection. This tungsten reed switch is probably my last hope at getting this bike running. So with it all wired up, will it withstand the sparking? I honestly can't express how happy I am that this works. Not only did the tungsten not degrade after a fair amount of runtime, but the sparking seems to have reduced. I then 3D printed a large pulley that will be used to drive the rear wheel, and this can mount to the wheel with a cutout that will fit over the original bike sprocket, and it's secured in position with some bolts. So with the drive belt attached and properly tensioned, the bike is nearly finished. I just want to add one more thing to complete the mechanical bike aesthetic, an analog voltmeter to see how much battery is left which fits perfectly in the center of the handlebars. I've also mounted two switches on the handlebars and some slightly messy wiring that should allow one switch to control the power to the motor and one switch to allow it to hopefully regeneratively charge the battery, or in this case, a small supercapacitor pack. I feel like I need to explain the purpose behind this setup. Regular electric motors have iron cores, which massively amplifies the electromagnetic strength of the coils, but it also leads to a resistance when the motor is unpowered, as the magnets are attracted to the core. Whereas this motor is almost entirely made from plastic, aside from a few bolts and the coils, which means it has very little resistance when spinning unpowered. So the idea is that it will ride like a regular bike with a small amount of drag from the belt, which isn't much. And then when I ride down a hill or want to decelerate, I can use the motor as a generator to charge these capacitors. Then once charged, I'm hoping it will be enough to give me a small boost of power when I need it. So let's see if it works. So I'm out here on a nice cold December British morning. The capacitors are completely discharged, as you can see from the voltmeter. And if I wiggle the handlebars, we can fake some charge, but obviously that's not 
actually charge. So let's take the bike for a little ride. Oh, it seems like we're charging the capacitors, even though I haven't pressed the regen switch yet, which is a bit strange. But there doesn't seem to be much resistance on the pedals, which I suppose is a good thing that it's charging that easily. The reed switches are a bit noisy. <laughs> They're uh, probably similar volume to uh, one of those loud freewheel hubs, uh, but a bit worse because they're making the noise constantly. So I'm now going down a hill and I'm gonna press the regen button. And it seems to be charging a bit quicker now. We're nearly at, uh, yeah, we're at 10 volts, wow. I think these capacitors are rated to about 18 volts. So uh, we're well in the clear at the moment. Okay, so I'm coming to a flat now, and I'm gonna bring the bike to a stop. Uh, we're at about 12 and a half, 13 volts. So uh, let's see if we can uh, use this power to get us back up to speed. It is powering me, uh, just not very much power. <laughs> yeah, so we drained about five volts getting up to uh, speed. And uh, it's not draining anymore because uh, this is the max RPM the motor will do at this voltage. So we're back up to 11 volts and I'm going to apply the throttle to see if we can climb this hill. Yeah, it doesn't quite have enough power to get up any hills. I feel like this bike ticks two of the three boxes I originally wanted in that it regeneratively charges and has very little resistance when riding unpowered. It's just lacking the power required to be a viable e-bike option. And being completely mechanical isn't as great as I'd hoped, as the metal strips of the reed switches constantly need adjusting, because if I ride too fast, they hit a resonant frequency, so it ends up either being too far from the tungsten contact or too close, which causes some major sparking. But how about we take the regenerative braking portion of the bike and use it to charge something else. Because the motor is essentially wired up just like my hand crank generator, it outputs AC power when spinning. So if we use four diodes to construct a full bridge rectifier, we should be able to charge the capacitors even faster. Then we can plug the capacitors into a USB voltage regulator to use the stored energy to say, charge my phone. And whilst riding, the charger doesn't work when the capacitors are below 8 volts. But with a short press of the regen button, we can raise the voltage quickly, and then the energy can slowly discharge into my phone. Over the 6 kilometers or 3.7 miles I rode, I descended about 55 meters, and managed to charge my phone nearly 10%, which isn't bad considering I only used it down the hills, or when I needed to brake. And one hill I rode down was so long that I was worried I'd overcharge the capacitors, so I let go of the switch. Now I know there are products out there you can buy which use a small generator to power a bike light, but those add a constant drag to the wheel when turned on. But this system can be used to rapidly charge the capacitors when braking or riding down a hill, and then it will trickle charge my phone or bike light or anything I want really, which is basically free energy because if I didn't have this set up, it would just go into heating and wearing my brake pads. Thank you very much for watching. 